Hi there, and welcome to the channel of A Disappointed Man with me, Jason Kennedy, The Disappointed Man. And the topic of this talk, it's part one, will be Saki, the complete Saki. And the first thing I have to say is it should be called the incomplete Saki, because it's not everything. There are a number of fine short stories, including the East Wing, that are not included here. And he also wrote innumerable political sketches and barely any of them make it into this. So it's really the tales as they were collected during Saki's lifetime, plus his two novels, The Unbearable Bassington and When William Came. So who was Saki? Well, his real name was Hector Hugh Monroe, and he was born in 1870 in what was then called Burma. And like many boys born in the colonies, individuals such as Denton Welsh, Rudyard Kipling, and George Orwell, he was sent back to England to be educated. But here, tragedy struck, and Saki's mum was killed by, of all things, a cow. After this sad occurrence, he was handed over to the care of two tyrannical aunts, and he barely was allowed to play outside until he escaped at the age of 12 to his boarding school. And Saki's sister, in a biography of him, speculated that it was this deprivation, this absence of stimulation, which nurtured her brother's incredible powers of imagination and also gave that imagination a sinister, rather violent cast. Now, although these tales reek of end-of-the-century decadence, Saki only begins his career as a writer of fiction just months before the death of his hero Oscar Wilde. After his demise, Saki takes over as the foremost purveyor of wit in Edwardian society until his own death in the First World War when he was killed by a German sniper's bullet. His last words reputedly were, put that bloody cigarette out. After Saki's death, it is Evelyn War, Noel Coward and P.G. Woodhouse who continue his legacy. That's enough by way of introduction, so let's get into the short stories themselves. Now, when I raised the prospect of discussing this book, a commenter said, Jason, I have that edition and I'm always wondering how to get into it because is it really feasible to try and plough through what are almost 600 pages of short stories? The question is, how does one read Saki? And my answer would be, well, absolutely not. You cannot try to just read this cover to cover. I would liken a Saki short story to a piece of confectionery, perhaps a chocolate eclair. Now, the first one is delicious. The second one not so much, and the third one decidedly less so, and the fourth you're pushing the plate away. So I tend to read just one Saki story and then retreat and return when I'm ready for another serving. But having said that, for this channel I have ploughed through 300 pages of these tales and I've read the first three collections and they are Reginald, Reginald in Russia and the Chronicles of Clovis and actually they do make a kind of unit. There is a sense of a whole from reading these and you'll understand why when I engage with them. Now Reginald doesn't really have anything that you would recognise as a short story. Instead it's kind of glittering talk. And Reginald is a dandy, which means he's a feat. He prioritises his personal appearance. He never works. And when he speaks, he speaks like the wittiest character in the wittiest play of Oscar Wilde. OK, so that should give you a sense of it. Now, I really enjoyed these um, sketches. And the language in them is just wonderful. For example, there is Reginald on presents, where he says there's always an aunt who sends a tie, a spotted horror that one could only wear in secret or on the Tottenham Court Road. OK, so that gives you a sense of it from memory there. It's very memorable prose. And there's another one here when he's been accused of having um, no 
kind of moral compass, and this is Reginald's response. There are certain fixed rules that one observes for one's own comfort. For instance, never be flippantly rude to any inoffensive, grey-bearded stranger that you may meet in pine forests or hotel smoking rooms on the continent. It always turns out to be the King of Sweden. Yeah, so I did really um, enjoy this collection, so I would recommend kind of going through these in their totality. After this, though, we get Reginald in Russia, and here Saki is trying to start um, creating fully formed tales, some of which don't even feature Reginald, and they have this sinister air. But I didn't believe that any of them were a success, with one extremely notable exception. Even the glittering talk um, sketches with Reginald begin to lose some of their luster, and I did find this collection particularly disappointing. The only story I recommend that you read is The Mouse. Now, in my view, The Mouse is one of the funniest stories in the English language. It's scarcely credible how hilarious this story truly is. I would suggest having an oxygen cylinder close at hand because I certainly struggle to breathe after entering the midsection of this and it's unrelenting, it's side splitting and it also works really well if it's read to an audience. I'm not going to quote a single word of this fabulous tale because I would not wish to spoil its magic for any of you watching this video. But believe me, the mouse, once read, never forgotten. So when we turn to the Chronicles of Clovis, what we find here is astonishing in terms of the advancement of Saki's art, because suddenly all of the technical deficiencies of Reginald and Reginald in Russia are swept away. The standalone tales are of exceptional quality. There are at least five classic short stories here. Tobamori, in which a man teaches a cat to speak. The Unrest Cure. Shredni Vashtar, which recalls Saki's unhappy childhood. The Music on the Hill. And my own personal favourite, The Hounds of Fate. And the stories that centre on glittering talk. Clovis Sangrail is a massive improvement on Reginald because he is a genuine protagonist as in the unrest cure. And we also have his relationship with his aunt, with his mother, with Bertie Van Tarn and the Baroness. And I'll just read you a little of this, um, the talking out of Tarrington, where um, Clovis's aunt doesn't want to invite this dreadful boar, Tarrington, to a garden party, which is being attended by a royal. And so Clovis takes over to repel him. And it goes like this. Tarrington says, I expect you don't know me with my moustache, said the newcomer. I've only grown it during the last two months. On the contrary, said Clovis, the moustache is the only thing about you that seemed familiar to me. I felt certain that I'd met it somewhere before. My name is Tarrington, resumed the candidate for recognition. A very useful kind of name, said Clovis. With a name of that sort, no one would blame you if you did nothing in particular heroic or remarkable, would they? And yet... If you were to raise a troop of light horse in a moment of national emergency, Tarrington's light horse would sound quite appropriate and pulse quickening, whereas if you were called Spoopin, for instance, the thing would be out of the question. No one, even in a moment of national emergency, could possibly belong to Spoopin's horse. The newcomer smiled weakly, as one who is not to be put off by mere flippancy, and began again with patient persistence. I think you ought to remember my name. I shall, said Clovis, with an air of immense sincer sincerity. My aunt was asking me only this morning to suggest names for four young owls. She's just had sent her as pets. I shall call them all Tarrington. Then if one or two of them die or fly away, or leave us in any of the ways that pet owls are prone to, there will always be one or two to carry on your name. There, it's wonderful, isn't it? Now, two of the other stories that center on the talk I would just mention briefly. One of them has interest because it's based on the pattern in this, in the complete works of Oscar Wilde, which is incomplete, the decay of lying. And the conceit here 
is that um, a person who is in the process of writing something is interrupted by a friend and they then discuss the thing that they are working on. So what's stimulating to me there is just what a transparent act of homage it is to the master who in another story Saki obliquely refers to Wilde as he who must never be contradicted. So that had its interest for me. And then there's another one, it has very long titles, so I have to read it out. And that is The Secret Sin of Septimus Brobe. And what's great about this is it showcases the mercenary instincts of Clovis, his immorality. Not only is it quite a good tale with a lot of good jokes, but the elements are perfectly deployed here. And it really does work. And after stumbling into the secret of one of the characters, Clovis effectively blackmails him into letting him accompany him on a trip through the Mediterranean. That is an excellent story too. So with the Chronicles of Clovis, I recommend reading all of them. The range that one finds in the Chronicles of Clovis, it's as if you're reading a melding together of Lewis Carroll, Rudyard Kipling, and Oscar Wilde. That's just how good it is. You've got the surreal touches of Lewis Carroll and the childhood fairy tale quality. And then you've got all the animal elements that one finds in Kipling. And then you have the sparkling language of Oscar Wilde. It's absolutely a treat. And I'm not just kind of asserting that these influences are there. Saki wrote some political sketches called Alice in Westminster, and they have very good illustrations that accompany them. I'll put the link below. And he also wrote the Not So Stories, which parodied Kipling. And of course, the debt to Wilde is absolutely everywhere. So I hope I've kind of at least inspired one of you would be enough to just pick up some Saki stories and give them a read. You don't even need to buy the book. It's all in the public domain. You can pick them up on archive.org. And that will conclude part one of this Saki talk. And before I go, I shall repeat my mantra. Be safe, be strong, and until we meet anon, Nanu Nanu.